Our Father in heaven, we are gathered here together with one purpose and one purpose only, to commune with you, to study about your word, to put things into practice, into perspective, and to walk with you, Lord. And so as we start this morning in our study, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be present in this place. And we ask, Lord, that you and your name will be exalted. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we continue our series in the book of Acts, uh, we notice that chapter 1, we notice that Jesus is taken up into heaven and the disciples were left there and they went back to Jerusalem. And now, as we stated previously in the book of Acts, is where we find the history book of the New Testament, where it recounts all the events and the miracles that the disciples did and as they preached the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. And it's so peculiar to me, especially at this time, as we see the changing of the winter season to the spring. I already saw a couple of the trees that are starting to bloom and the trees and the flowers. I saw some of the, uh, maybe uh, David can help me a little bit more on that, but I saw a couple of the trees that already had uh, white little flowers on there blooming. I don't know if there were dogwoods or what it was, but... And so it's marvelous to see how a tree or how a flower, especially a tree, that you would see it that it was dormant. It would seem as it was dead, that it begins to have life and begins to bloom. And there's something, it seems like something magical that seems to start to happen as you see that life is blooming from the tree. And so our question this morning as we see this tree growing, obviously we've been getting a lot of rain lately and we see that the, the nutrients that is needed for the tree to, to come to life is our question this morning is how does the church grow and what are the elements needed for it to grow? Here in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, if you're there, uh, come and join me, Acts chapter 2, we see that we get to the point where it says that it was the Pentecost, known as the Feast of Weeks. And this is the festival in the Jewish community that celebrated the first fruits of the harvest, thanking the Lord for the agricultural provision. So here... The first fruits were brought forth to God as an act of praise, trusting that he would provide going on forward. In the Pentecost, we see that the first fruits symbolize beautifully the beginning of the great harvest of faith that was brought about the gift of the Spirit. Here we see, and it marks the solemn moment when the promise of the Spirit was bestowed along with the commitment of the church to the mission. I don't know if you're familiar with the story or not, but here we see the community of believers gathered in anticipation of the gift of the Spirit. Luke, who is the writer of this book, does not specify the location of those that were present, but we can see in the first four verses of chapter two, we see that there was others that were present because the spirit of, of the gift of the spirit was not reserved for the apostles alone. But Luke emphasizes that the fact that the community was tightly, tightly united and that they were seated to pray and to meditate. What would happen, as we talked about in our previous um, study, if the church 
were to gather together to pray. There's no doubt that this type of unity was the essential feature of the church in the early stages. And we see that the Holy Spirit comes down, the wind, the noise, the fire is associated here and connected with the outpouring of the Spirit. And as we talked previously, what was the essential ingredient? Just as the flower is blooming and the trees are growing, we see that all of it started with prayer. Anything that happened in the early church, it all started with prayer. Anything of significance started with prayer. And we see here that this outpouring of the Spirit were visible manifestations of the presence of God. Because we see in, in Moses, in the burning bush, students of the Bible would remember that uh, Moses saw this burning bush. And, and what did the voice said that came from there? The place in which you are. It's holy, right? And so the presence of God was there. What was the, was the place uh, holy in its own? Or what made the, the place holy? God's presence. And then we remember also the, pil the, the, the fire, the pillar of cloud, the fire at night. So what, 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 what does this all bring to us that God's presence is not contained in a place or in a building, you know? And so we see this visible manifestation of the presence of God as a consequence. We see the disciples and they begin to speak in different languages. However, in this context, it suggests that these disciples, the disciples were speaking in tongues. This was the gift of speaking in known foreign languages, meaning that these were actual languages people could understand. And it's so interesting because here in the Pentecost, we see something that is happening, which is the reversal of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11, when the Lord confused or created languages spoken and heard upon one harmonious group of people, all speaking one common language. But in Acts chapter 2, we see that the Lord makes the people of many different languages hear the gospel in their respective languages. In a sense, he is bringing restoration to the languages so that the many people were brought together under one gospel. God didn't take away all the languages and only created and just established one language but he restored the languages. And we see here after chapter uh, verse four, we see that in verse five, people had been traveling from all over the Roman Empire, God fearing Jews all over the nation. Verse five says that they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And this is known, this is what is known as the Jewish diaspora. I don't know if you ever heard that word, diaspora. But diaspora basically is a population, in this case, the Jewish people, they were scattered across the regions which are in separate geographical place or origin. So an example of a diaspora is me, literally. My, my dad is from uh, Mexico and my mom is from El Salvador but I'm here in Mount Pleasant, Texas. <laughs> so I am a, a diaspora. And so it continues, as you see here, a list of 15 nations, all coming from verses 9 through 11. We see that there is mentioned different regions of the ancient world. That these were la large numbers of Jewish people, like 15 different nations. They were all gathered there together. And so these Jewish people were still celebrating the feast. They were still God-fearing Jewish people. They were still there. But for some reason, they had all been dispersed all over the Roman Empire. And they all had come together. And it's interesting that following all of these events, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all the way from verse 1 to verses 4, we see following all these events that Peter 
begins to preach to the crowd. And as he begins to preach to the, to the crowd, this powerful message of conviction to this multi-ethnic Jews. Verse 37 says that after they heard this message, the people heard this and they were cut to the hearts. And they said to Peter and to the apostles, and they asked, what should we do? And verse 38 says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They repented, and they were baptized for forgiveness, and they received the Holy Spirit. And so as a result of Peter's preaching and the outpouring of the Spirit, a new community is formed. Remember chapter 1, we saw that the disciples were there, gathered together with the woman. They were following Jesus there to the cross. No longer was this community only the 12 disciples, only the ladies, the women that were there. But now we see that a new community is born, a multi-ethnic, multicultural body of believers who trust in the risen and reigning Christ. They have been gifted the power of the Holy Spirit. So the people of God went from one centralized place, one centralized nation to become an international one. They, they, they came from one language to become multilingual. And there was urgency because Christ had risen. Christ had resurrected no longer. What does Romans says? No longer there is condemnation. No, no, no longer. Let me, let me find the verse here. Romans 5. It says, Rom, Romans 5, I think, it says here, uh, let, me, let me find it. It says, it says um, j verse 6, let's see, you see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely you see anyone die for a righteous person. But God demonstrates, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So there's the urgent message. God's love. Christ died for us. But there's a need for this message of the gospel to be taken to all the nations. You need ambassadors from every nation. And in this story, we see how Peter's powerful message of of three that they were so powerful, they convicted all these people, and 3,000 people were baptized in a day. You see, God raises this minority, this remnant, this humble community that is now multi ethnic, multicultural. And after this, 3,000 people are baptized, and this community is formed. And that is when we pick up the text from this morning, the text from this morning. And the question is, how does, this, how does the church grow? Follow with me closely, just a few more minutes. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with all as many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were gathered and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so, how does the church grow? There are four ways in which the ancient church is described in which they grew. Number one, the apostles' teachings. 
Number two, the fellowship. And number three, the breaking of the bread. Number four, prayer. Number one, the apostles' teachings. Here in verse 42, we see that it provides a description of the life of the community of the believers, which including a proclamation of the apostles' teachings. Well, what was the apostles' teachings? Was the message of Jesus. That is the message of the gospel, explaining the meaning of the cross of Christ. So I ask, MPC, where does our nourishment come from? Where is our spiritual nourishment come from? Are we, as the early church, the, the ancient church, the community of believers, being filled, nourished every day by the teachings of Jesus? Where is our spiritual nourishment coming from? What is at, the, at, the, at the, our table or our bedside when we go to sleep or when we wake up? What is the first thing that we pick up as soon as we wake up? Is it our phone? What are we watching? What are we listening to in the morning while we're getting ready or eating breakfast? At times, we might feel frustrated or even disoriented as a result of a hurried pace culture in which we live. There seems to be a, a balance or a, a, res, a, a result of just going on a hurry constantly, constantly with little time for Jesus. But reading scripture grounds us in God and aligns us with his purpose for our lives. The role of scripture both in the ancient church and for the modern church was to become, not to become more intellectual, but to become more like Jesus. I'm sure that we all know and, and we all have met people who know the Bible very well, but we are surprised that they do not know God. We all have seen people who can quote scripture, but do, they do not imitate the way of Jesus. People who know the Old Testament and the New Testament and yet are not kind people. Knowing the truth and being a disciple of Jesus is not about information, but formation. What is forming us? Are we becoming more like Jesus? Are we, as the community of believers, not only invested in the way of Jesus, but being in getting that nourishment every day? Eugene Peterson says, Christians don't simply learn or study the use of Scripture. We assimilate it, take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized in acts of love cups of cold water, missions into the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name, hands raised in adoration of the Father, feet washed in the company of the Son. The role of Scripture is not to become more intellectual, but to become more like Jesus. Number two, fellowship. The Greek word that is used here is the, the word koinonia. Fellowship or community. A few verses later, it says that they had everything in common. And you know what that means? Not only that they all were thinking the same things, but that they were all praying for the same things. They had everything in common. If there was a need, they were all praying for the same thing. Representing the purity of their selflessness. A characteristic of God's kingdom. This is an essential attribute of the Christian mission. I don't have to get all the credit. I, I, people don't have to know that I did something because at the end of the day, I'm not doing it for the people. I'm not doing it even for the church. I'm doing it for God. And that's what's more important. Don't see what is ours as ours, but we are willing to share. We see those things as belonging to God. We are selfless. Instead, God, we see that God blesses them. The more that they give, the, the more that they are blessed. And the church becomes a steward of God's blessings to those who have less. 
a place of hospitality, of healing. Is this a safe place, a safe space where people can come and share? Imagine a community who is bound together by the love of God and ignited by the Holy Spirit. That, that the mentality of the community shifts from this is mine to this is ours. Imagine what would happen. This, the reality is, is not something only that happened in the past, but something that I've seen in, differ, in different congregations. And I've seen that here too. People in this church are very generous. We all come together. We all help out. We're all constantly praying for each other. Generosity is an important ingredient. Why do our members should give up uh, uh, their own money that they work so hard to help others? Is that because we recognize that at the center of our generosity, we are being blessed by God to bless others so that our children, we also, with our generosity, we also want our children to learn more of Jesus. We want to share that joy with other residents. That's the reason why this church exists. That's the reason why uh, the announcement, we're doing that community inventory. We want to share what we have with our community. What about if this place here in Mount Pleasant was a hub for the city where we, they would recognize us for helping others? What would happen? We are doing the clinics, the projects, the vision clinic, the dental clinic. All those things are created, and they're created for one purpose only, to bless the community. Just like the ancient times, the Holy Spirit is seeking to catalyze communities of generosity. Number one, we see the apostles' teachings. Number two, we see fellowship. Number three, we see the breaking of the bread. And the breaking of the bread that is mentioned here, this expression is a unique expression of a community united in Christ and giving the expectation of his return. But this breaking of the bread sometimes is associated to communion service. But you see that in the early church, they didn't see a division between something like this, the community service, and what we're about to do here shortly, eating over there. They didn't see a distinction of, of sharing a meal because both things were con considered holy. They saw the Lord's Supper as holy, but they saw feeding the stranger, the hungry, as holy as well. And so whenever you have this, this, this remember back then in the Roman Hellenistic era, when, when emperors or when people of important class used to meet with each, each other, historians said that they were, when they were gathered at the table, they would be gathered in a, in, in a positional uh, amount of power. So those with more power were closest to the host, and those who had less were, sit, were seated further away from the table. And so... The, com the community of believers coming together and breaking uh, bread together, they were saying from a social economic ladder, they were saying, we don't care where you come from or what you have or you don't have or what type of class you are from. You belong at this table. We're all the same. There is no difference between us. Physically healthy or spiritually on our journey, one day what we are announcing to the people in our public life is that one day by faith we will all feast at the heavenly banquet with God as one people. There is no difference. We're all the same. There is no positional hierarchical power between us. And so, not directly, but indirectly, just by sharing a meal, just by eating together, 
they were, they were, they were already preaching the gospel. They were already living the way of Jesus. Last one, prayer. Luke notes that these were the prayers. There were petitions offered in the synagogues and the temples. Prayers were addressed for one another. They were, they were used to strengthen the unity of the church. And here at the church, let me, let me tell you, I believe in the power of prayer. And I've seen so many miracles already from the moment that I've been here with you all. And I am a strong believer in the power of prayer. I want this church to be known as a church that prays. I want people that come from the outside to know that we hear, we pray. Prayer is not a time to have the Holy Spirit do what we want, but to, for us to align with what God wants. The need of the early church is the need of the modern church today. Big, bold, urgent, fervent prayers by the people of God. And when we pray, just like it was in ancient times and in modern times, the Holy Spirit ignites the church. Nothing that is worth mentioning here this morning, nothing that is worth us doing on our own, will be impactful or meaningful without the Holy Spirit. It all starts with prayer. And when I look at the story of the ancient church and I see how they lived out their lives in these four ways, the apostles' teachings, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayer, all under the umbrella of the Holy Spirit, then we see Acts 2.47. And it says that the Lord added to their number as a consequence of their living their lives. So what we're trying to form here, what we're trying to do here is not a theory. What we're trying to do here is a practice. We're trying to live it out. We're trying to, to, to show others what already started here. It has to start with us. It has to start in our hearts. We have to believe it. First, to do it. A.W. Tozer says, If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and nobody would know the difference. How did the church grow? There you have it. These were the four ways in which the church grew. And for the modern church of today, I believe that the same is possible for us. To grow and to see great deeds in God in our time. The invitation for us is to move forward as a church that is in total and other dependence of the Holy Spirit. The moment is now. Let's become part of the movement. Revitalize us, Lord. Do it again, just as you did with the ancient church. Wake us up, Lord. Do it again. The harvest is ready but the laborers are few. We're getting ready here in a couple, maybe a month and a half to have a couple meetings here in our church. We have over 15 Bible studies. People are thirsty and hungry for God. And how things are going, let me tell you, Jesus is coming soon. What are we going to do? Are we going to wake up? Ask the Holy Spirit to ignite us? To wake us up? To work for Him? 
Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Our Father in heaven, um, we thank you so much for your promise in our lives. Lord, we want to live here in this modern church just the, like the ancient church lived, to be with fire from the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we want, Lord, to lead us day by day in everything that we do, Lord, until we reach that promised land. Thank you so much for loving us and sustaining us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.